very welcome to today's seminar here at SCAS. Um, we have the pleasure of having Suzanne Wengler here, uh, who will give today's talk. Uh, Suzanne has a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and she is Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of Notre Dame. And this academic year, we have the privilege of having her here at SCAS as a Urias Fellow. And the Urias Fellowship Program is an initiative of the NET EAS, the Network of European Institutes for Advanced Study. Her research area is fascinating. Uh, it's both the classical and highly topical. And in broad terms, it examines how market institutions and regulations evolve. Uh, what politics make them possible in the first place, but also how their effects change the political conditions in which they were formulated to begin with. She is the author of, among other things, Post-Soviet Power, State-Led Development and Russia's Marketization, uh, published by Cambridge, Cambridge University Press in 2015, on the political economy of newly created electricity markets in Russia. And this book was awarded honorable mention in the 2016 Ed Hewitt Book Prize for being an outstanding monograph in political economy. Uh, and this was done by the Association for Study of Eastern Europe, Eurasian and Slavic Studies. Suzanne has also conducted research and published on many other aspects of Russia's post-Soviet transformations for example, on agriculture, welfare provisions, and the politics of expertise. And she has published extensively on these topics as well. Now, the empirical focus of our current project is agriculture and food production in Russia and in the United States. And here she is testing, exploring uh, new ways to think about inequality and distribution in these two late modern economies and more broadly, I should say. So here at SCAS, she works on a book manuscript that examines and compares the evolution of industrial food systems in the United States and Soviet and post-Soviet Russia, tentatively entitled Setting the Table, which also is the title of her seminar today. Warmly welcome, Suzanne. Thank you, Christina. Uh, thank you, Bjorn. Thank you, SCAS for the invitation and for the time I can spend here uh, on my research. Thank you uh, to all the fellows here and former fellows and everyone else for your time and for your interest. Um, uh, so it's an honor to kick off the first uh, seminar uh, in this series um, with some of my findings on Russia's food system. Good, wonderful. So I'll um, start off uh, with giving you a little bit of a bigger, uh, a sense of a bigger debate in my field, right? So I studied a post-Soviet transformation. One of the big questions that sort of came up after 91 as the Soviet Union collapsed is to how to think about change, right? Uh, right after the collapse of the planned economy and the Soviet Union, it was sort of an obvious way to think about change was to think about uh, one uh, set of institutions to another set of institutions, right? From the planned economy and a one-party state to a liberal market economy and a democratic polity. Um, and, you know, a lot of people thought about the transformation in these terms because those were two ways of thinking about the world that were really intuitive. Um, yet anyone who sort of paid attention sort of realized that this was really a helpful way to think about the transformation for a number of reasons. Uh, one, it was sort of presuming that we actually know what the endpoint is and that there's one type of, of market economy that we are transitioning towards. Um, and not only is every market economy different or every democracy is different, um, each of the post-Soviet states uh, you know, underwent different types of change and sort of idiosyncratic processes of, of political and economic change. So uh, Luke Inouye and Stephen Collier sort of t pointed out that this is not a useful conceptual framework and we need to think differently about the post-Soviet transformation. One of the reasons why it wasn't helpful was that it led to these 
uh, things that they called deficit studies, right? Often studies would sort of catalog the institutions that weren't there quite yet, right? So there were studies why Russia didn't have institution to value assets or why Russia didn't have property rights, right? And these kind of deficit studies would then sort of neglect all the institutional and, and socioeconomic and political transformations that had happened. So by early 2000, there was really sort of an agreement how to think beyond the transition model. And I think uh, this challenge is still very much with us, right? For every project, we have to think what is the framework of historical change that we're working with. So for, um, uh, for my project on Russian agri-food system, the transition model will basically tell us that we went from a system with pervasive shortages to a system where uh, go goods are abundantly provided, right? From shortages to abundance, right? There's nothing wrong with this view. It's just a very one-dimensional view of change. And it sort of neglects a lot of the big structural things and the small everyday details that have changed. So what I want to do in this presentation is, is tell you about some of the big things that have changed. Um, for example, um, one of the big things that has changed is that Starting in about 2000, uh, tremendous amounts of capital has been invested in the Russian agri-food se se sector. Um, and as part of this, uh, uh, so another way of thinking about capital inflow is basically that outsiders, um, not people from the village, sort of came to the Russian uh, agriculture sector and were, became really interested and acquired various assets related to agriculture, right? Um, so land, farms, and other facilities. So and one of the things that happened uh, as a result is that there was a really enormous, really large transfer of ownership of, of land assets uh, in Russia. Uh, another big thing that changed is how food is produced and what kind of diets uh, people uh, are consuming. Um, I will sort of, the third one is an interesting change to me, but I will mostly talk about the first two big changes. And I will answer questions like, you know, what kind of capital is this? Where did it come from? Uh, what happened once this money sort of hit the ground? Uh, why did this happen in the 2000s and not a decade earlier after the collapse of the Soviet Union? And, and what are some useful ways to think about all the changes that happened? So this is actually uh, also the structure of, of the presentation. Uh, those are points two and three, I will talk about the conditions for capital inflows and then the consequences of capital inflows. Before I do that, I'll talk a little bit about Soviet era farming, um, just to give you an idea of what, what it was that was changed in the post-Soviet period. Um, so Soviet farms, right? So I'll talk mostly about the changes in the 21st century, but I'm actually starting the story uh, in 1917. Right? Um, so the Bolshevik Revolution, as you know, uh, was led by a small group of urban revolutionaries. Uh, and they found themselves trying to govern a very large, uh, predominantly rural country. And this was really sort of the challenge that then shaped rural production for the remainder of the Soviet Union. The problem for the Bolshevik government was basically this. The socialist government wanted to industrialize and also had to fight a civil war. So to accomplish those two tasks, it needed the peasants to produce a lot of food and basically to hand over uh, the grain and the crops to the straight procurement agents. Now the government, Bolshevik government, didn't offer a lot of money in return and it had very little control of the countryside. So this ended up being a huge problem throughout the 1920s. Um, and this lack of control basically meant that peasants chose not to sell their grain to the state procurement agents. They had two other choices that were more attractive to them. One was to just grow food for subsistence production, and two, to grow grains but to sell them on the black market. Both of these solutions did not work for the Bolshevik government. So um, what this, sorry, what this led to was the Stalin's collectivization that started in 1921. Um, the collectivization was basically an attempt to gain control over the countryside and to extract um, grain from, from the peasants. Uh, and after sort of a, to a decade of trying to do, get peasants to do this, 
Stalin concluded that collectivization was the only solution. So as you probably know, um, it, collectivization was one of the sort of extremely violent and, and traumatic events of the 20th century, and it ended up um, somewhere between 12 and 17 million peasants died in these years between 29 and early 30s. So either they died in the village because they resisted, uh, they died on the way to being deported, or they starved in the aftermath of collectivization since the state agents basically took anything that was edible um, from the countryside. It was a deeply traumatic event and it was sort of very damaging for the social fabric of the countryside and for the relationship between the state and the peasants. Nevertheless, these collective farms endured for the remainder of the 20th, uh, 20th century. They became the backbone of industrial production uh, of food in the Soviet Union. And they were actually the way through which the state controlled both economic production as well as uh, the peasants as political actors. I'll talk less about the latter. Um, I'm, I'm mentioning all of this because I think it's important to remember how collective farms were created. They were created as an attempt by the state to take grain from the peasants who did not want to give it up. So a lot more could be said uh, about um, collective farms. I will say two more things. The first one is, is basically they did sort of perform the functions that the Bolshevik government wanted them to do. They, you know, throughout um, the Second World War, they fed the Red Army, and you know, from the 30s onward, uh, they fed the industrial workforce. So Russia industrialized rapidly, and uh, you know, the, the, the Red Army was, you know, had enough to eat. Uh, on the other hand, there were lots of problems with, with collective farms, and it was sort of an endless source of concern um, about uh, insufficient productivity and the lack of, of flexibility of, of collective farms. Um, the the success of Bolshevik governments came up with different solutions to this problem of collective farms, right? So, uh, and one way to think about what they did is to just throw more resources and different kind of resources at the problem. So, Stalin um, vastly increased the number of tractors. Khrushchev vastly increased the uh, amount of land under cultivation. Brezhnev increased the use of fertilizer, pesticides, and built these large um, processing facilities. Um, yet the sort of problems persisted, and, and it became more of a problem in the post-Soviet period when urban consumers demanded different kinds of food, uh, goods. So. As, as this was a problem for a consumer, it also became a problem for the government, right? The government was worried that there wasn't enough sausage for everyone, right? Um, and because of the political nature of this problem of, of not enough high quality proteins, uh, there was a lot of debate about what was the problem with collective farms. Uh, and you know, the debates are sort of interesting to me because they reflect who is, is commenting on this, right? So, uh, in the West, people thought it was the problem with incentives, right? If owner, if farmers do not own their land, so why would they produce enough, right? Uh, the, the Soviet co uh, commentators talked more about, you know, it's, it's really sort of a coordination problem. We cannot get this planned economy to get us enough inputs to the right place at the right time. So this is sort of the, the problem of supply bottlenecks. Um, the Soviet government also uh, often talked about the backward mentality of the peasants, right? The peasants just don't want to be industrialized. They don't want to be uh, productive, right? They're just sort of stuck in a previous way of thinking about the world. There's sort of a fourth explanation that's mentioned uh, in this book by Stefan Hedlund, who's a colleague uh, at the University of Uppsala, uh, who sort of says that, well, maybe it's a very big empire. It's very variable climates. Uh, and very unpredictable weather. So maybe there's something about the unpredictability and variability of agriculture that makes it really, really hard to plan, right? So a good, in other words, you know, uh, he, he sort of mentions this in passing, but I think it de deserves further uh, attention, right? So a, a good farmer needs to have sort of one eye on the weather and one eye on the soil, and uh, that is different for every location, and that is something that's really hard for planners to do. So whatever the problem, probably all of them, um, a little bit, maybe with the exception 
of the mentality. Um, that state farms continue to not quite produce enough uh, for urban consumers. Um, starting in the 70s, the state tried to make up for the shortcomings of collective farms by importing grains mostly as livestock feed. But really what sustained farming was not the imports, it was a second type of agriculture, and that's uh, known as subsistence plots or household farming. I apologize for the size of the fonts. That was sort of happened on the way over from my office to here somehow. Uh, so subsistence plots are tiny plots, right? Some hallmarks of subsistence farm is that they're really small plots. Um, uh, point 0.25 to 0.5 hectares. It's very labor intensive, and uh, the land is worked by household. Um, the, you know, collective farms were under constant scrutiny, and everyone debated the co collective farms. But this is actually where a lot of the food came from. Um, in Russian, they're known as lichnaya podsobnaya chazyaistva, which literally translates as personal subsidiary agriculture, right? That's how the state called it. Which sort of, uh, and in the West they were called uh, private farms or private agriculture. Um, the, the Soviet government um, was really sort of ambiguous about this form of, of agriculture because on the one hand, they relied on it, right? It fed a lot of people. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they you know, disliked it and very suspicious of this sort of private small scale agriculture that was not at all conformant to the you know, industrial ideals that they were pursuing. Um, they also thought of it as essentially a temporary phenomenon, sort of as an artifact of the backward mentality. You know, this is just the peasants still kind of farming like they really do, but it's going to go away. So on the whole, they sort of mostly neglected it and, and uh, you know, didn't, um, uh, didn't try to sort of modernize it. Uh, it is, it did, however, so the state re reluctantly tolerated it. Um, it did, however, sort of make up uh, a lot of the overall production. Sort of how much exactly varies over the year. Sort of uh, one way to think about it in total is that between a quarter and half of proteins uh, originated in substance, subsistence plots and about half of fruits and vegetables. Um, oh my god, I'm so sorry. This happened as I saved it. So this is not very useful, but the, the last figures are for 85, uh, it's 60% of potatoes, 29% of vegetables, 28% of meat, and 28% of eggs, right? So um, it's basically sort of uh, a sector where food comes from that the planned economy isn't very good at uh, supplying. Uh, a second interesting thing about subsistence plots is that they are not just a rural phenomena. They were more important in rural areas, uh, but lots of urban residents also had these kind of plots. So uh, this is a quote from uh, a historian, uh, Eugen Wedekind, who wrote about um, this kind of farming in the 1960s. And he wrote about Gorky, a, a little town, uh, I think it's about 500 kilometers west of uh, Moscow, it's today's Nizhny Novgorod. So Gorky uh, has a big uh, foundry uh, that produces produce things for the Red Army, uh, or actually for the Red Fleet, uh, to be precise. Uh, and so it was sort of reasonably high up in the hierarchy of the Soviet planned economy. So this is not a town that's far out somewhere. It isn't Moscow and Petersburg, uh, but you know, uh, it's, it's a place where people wanted to live. So um, Vedekin says the following thing about the city. He says the city has 50,000 inhabitants, um, and there are 7,500 individuals with plots, uh, 1,400 cows, several thousand pigs, 37,000 fruit trees. He says not only do several thousand metal workers live in the cities, there are also over several thousand people who work plots uh, with vegetables and livestock. So that kind of gives you a sense that you know, people could be industrial workers, but they, many of them also had these plots on the side. Um, one impl implication of this prevalence of this uh, kind of farming was that actually a very, a very large share of Soviet families were in one way or other uh, engaged in food production. So I'll just show you two more pictures of these modes of production. They were quite different, right? I could talk more about just how they were different. Um, 
but you can think of um, uh, El Pejá as sort of a buffer for the, the planned, whenever the planned economy didn't quite function, a food came from the El Pejá sector. Um, they're quite different, but they actually also relied on each other. So um, uh, Judith Pallet uh, talks about the symbiotic relationship between those two farms, right? Um, the El Pejá actually relies on collective farms for many of its inputs, right? Rural residents used the tools. Uh, most important was the feed for their livestock um, and things like veterinarian services and then the whole infrastructure of the collective farms were used by the um, small-scale farmers. The collective farm, in turn, also relied on the El Pejá. Uh, so on many occasions, or on a few occasions, actually, collective farm managers would requisition uh, goods from the household farm to fulfill plan target, right? Most notoriously, this happened uh, under Khrushchev uh, when there was a lot of pressure to ha have more meat, but the collective uh, farms just didn't have enough animals, so they would take the animals from the household farms. Um, uh, El Pejá also just relied on, uh, sorry, the collective farms also just relied on El Pejá uh, to sustain workers. This was most obvious in Stalin's time when Stalin didn't really pay workers anything, and if he paid them anything, he just paid them once a year, right? So they actually just relied on food from these plots. And, and over the years, kolkhozniki were paid, but often not enough um, to survive. So this kind of symbiotic or bimodal farming was really how agriculture looked like for uh, the, the whole duration of the Soviet period, and it's also how it looked like uh, in 91 when the Soviet Union fell apart. So this is when change began and uh, uh, I want to sort of find ways to think about change um, that um, are helpful, right? So let me um, talk about the post-Soviet transformation and, and what happened then. So what happened uh, first was uh, not very much, actually. So Yeltsin privatized farms in 92, right? Uh, and the privatization of farms turned collective farms into joint stock companies and basically gave the farmers uh, shares in these newly created farm enterprises. And so the Kolkhozniki had uh, two choices. Uh, they were now member owners of their collective farms and they could either continue farming as uh, part of the collective or they could take their land share out of the collective and farm privately. Um, so this kind of privatization was a very important legal and political change, right? Um, it gave the rural, the, the farmers uh, ownership and use rights, which they hadn't had respectively since 1917 and 1929. Uh, However, um, not much changed after that, actually. Uh, farmers, most farmers did not opt to take their land out of the collective. They sort of continued to work as part of the collective and, and neither farming methods nor the organization, the economic organization of farming changed for many years. Uh, they were, and sort of this was sort of the, the debate at the time, why did nothing happen, right? So the institutionalists in my field usually expect institutional change to be followed by changes in economic reality. Um, but there were a lot of problems for farmers, and one of the biggest problems was money, right? So Jessica Pisano is a colleague of mine, and she sort of summarizes it nicely. She says, well, farming requires capitals, and few villagers had any way of, farming requires money, and few villagers had any way of getting it. So um, the rest of the 90s were sort of pretty miserable, and the 90s was a pretty miserable decade for Russian farmers, uh, even by the standards of the Russian countryside. So for the following reasons. Um, the procurement channels that had sort of made up the planned economy disintegrated. So farmers didn't know who to buy from and who to sell to. Uh, the liberalization of trade uh, meant that a lot of uh, imported goods became available um, and were sort of magnificent competitors for Russian goods. All the inputs for farming became very expensive, uh, but the prices for the agricultural commodities were very low again, now sort of competing with international commodities. Uh, and so by the end of the 90s, about 90% of collectives 
had uh, collect these new collective farm enterprises had declared bankruptcy. This uh, was all led to a lot of out migration from the village and, and sort of uh, really the, the villages were not doing well in the, in the 90s. Um, things started to change quite quickly and quite dramatically in the sort of early 2000. Uh, and uh, so a lot of uh, money was invested in the Russian countryside. And um, I should have mentioned this at the outset, this was surprising in many ways because um, Russia actually had a huge problem of capital flight at the time. So anybody who had money was bringing it out of the country, right? Uh, once they brought it out of the country, they would invest it in fancy real estate and soccer teams, uh, and they would, the, the sort of Soviet collective farm was not a likely target for investment, neither for Russians nor for foreigners. So how did this, how did this change? This sort of countryside was sort of epitomized backwardness, and clearly in the 2000s it became to be seen as an investment opportunity. So um, I will talk about how this happened in a little bit, but I want to just say a few more things about this graph, right? So this is a graph about annual capital investment, fixed capital investment uh, in agriculture. So these are annual amounts. So it's a lot of money if you think about this as capital stock, because you, this is sort of cumulative investment, right? Um, another notable thing is that it continues to rise, and, ooh, I can use my pointer here. Uh, is the 2008 financial crisis. We have a little bit of a dip. The oil prices uh, are really low at the time, and that's really terrible for the Russian economy. But really, it, it picks right up. Um, a second crisis in Russia is 2015, after Russia annexes the Crimea. Sanctions are placed on Russia, and the Russian economy is not doing so well, but um, agricultural investment continues to grow. So this is quite remarkable, and it's not uh, same. We don't see this pattern in other sectors of the Russian economy. Um, a third interesting thing about these capital flows is that um, they're really quite diverse. The origin of these capital investments is quite diverse. So a lot of different people sort of come to the same conclusion. Um, so a large part of the capital is Russian oligarchic capital, right? So Russian oligarchs are buying land assets. But really, a lot of it is also uh, this repatriated capital, so capital that fled away to Cyprus is coming back to Russia. Uh, but there's also a lot of capital investment from all over the world. This is there's private investors and pension funds from Western Europe and the US. And there's sovereign wealth funds uh, from China and the Middle East. And uh, since we're in Sweden, I thought I mentioned this. One company, it's called Black Earth Farming Limited. Uh, it's a, a, a founded by three Swedish businessmen who operate farms in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, Black Earth Farming had an IPO on the uh, stock exchange, on the Stockholm Stock Exchange in 2007. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest in it. You know, me meanwhile, the company has gone bankrupt, but, you know, it had a bright future in 2007. Um, so this work, uh, sorry, uh, on the origin of capital flows is done by uh, One Visser and Max Spohr, who are uh, in Rotterdam in, in the Netherlands. Uh, and and the, they've, done, they've conducted this research because there's a growing interest in the financialization of agriculture. So this is the sort of Russian story. A lot of capital from different types of investors come to Russia. So w how did this happen, right? What, what are the conditions for capital inflows? Um, there's, there's three big things. Um, first, uh, Russia defaulted on its foreign debt in uh, 98, which led to the devaluation of the ruble. So foreign imports all of a sudden became more expensive, right? So it was easier for Russian producers to produce domestically. Uh, more importantly are the, are the next two uh, conditions. So the first had to do nothing to do with Russia at all. Factors entirely unrelated to Russia led to the increase in commodity prices for food crops in the sort of early 2000s. Uh, this was mostly had to do with the EU and the US passing a law that required gasoline to be mixed with biofuels, right? Um, and one of the unintended side effects uh, of these policies was a rapid increase in global prices for all food commodities because of the diversion of arable land to the biofuels. 
Um, so in other words, you know, food crops all of a sudden were more valuable, and so investors everywhere were turning to land and agricultural operators as investments. The third thing was a Russian domestic development. So Putin came to power in 2000 and significantly changed Russia's political priorities and economic policies. I, I don't want to say much about Yeltsin's economic policies, but they were sort of probably fair to say that they were overall quite disastrous. Uh, two of the many disastrous uh, effects was that they led to hyperinflation and to uh, including food price inflation, right? So this meant that uh, Russian pensioners and state employees and other vulnerable uh, populations basically couldn't afford to buy uh, food staples. Uh, secondly, trade liberalization in the 90s led to a rapid uh, sort of increase in food imports. Uh, and this was increasingly seen as a dependent on food, dependence on foreign food imports. So these were two things that Putin did not like. He realized that food price inflation was one of the economic realities that had made Yeltsin really unpopular. And Putin being Putin didn't like the idea of depending on the West for food imports. So um, I'll, I wrote a paper on this last year, so I will stop talking about this, but uh, the policy side of this is quite um, fascinating. What followed was basically a series of state programs that supported domestic producers, right? So Putin wanted to strengthen domestic producers and he managed to do this and reduce food imports. Uh, so one thing I wanted to mention uh, with the picture is that as it often happens, with these policies, some uh, actors benefited more than others, right? So uh, this is a, a picture of Putin with a representative of uh, what's called an agro-holding, and I'll talk more about the agro-holding companies in a minute. So let me now talk, uh, turn to the cap consequences of capital inflows. So when I started uh, with this research, um, I basically, uh, and this is what I, part of what I did this fall, I came up with this sort of long laundry list of all the things that changed after this money came to Russia and to Russian agriculture. Um, so laundry lists are sort of rarely uh, compelling. So I was trying to find a different way of thinking about this change. So um, what I'm suggesting is that we should think about this change and the consequences of capital inflows as real, all kinds of relationships that come, are changed, right? Relationships are reconfigured as capital uh, is invested. So these are relations between actors in the Russian and the global food systems. And so I will look uh, in the rest of the presentation at three, three kinds of relationships. One is the relationship between uh, large and small scale producers in the village. One is the relationship between Russian producers and global actors. And then a third a set of relationship is between producers uh, and nature, sort of a big vague one over there. Um, so before I go on, I want to talk about these new actors, right? Um, so at the center of all these relationships were a new t type of actor, right? Uh, in Russian, they're called agroholding, uh, agroholding. Uh, sometimes people call them new agricultural operators, uh, which sort of emphasize the newness and the strangeness of these actors. Um, I will call them agroholdings, I guess. Uh, they are uh, some of them are publicly traded companies, uh, and we know more about those because they are under reporting requirements and publish uh, reports and all kinds of things. But many of them are privately owned, and we really sort of don't know that much about the, the privately owned ones uh, other than what they share with us. Um, so in terms of the activi their activity, there's basically two types. One f type specializes in grain production and sort of produce some of the uh, traditional Russian field crops such as wheat, barley, oats, uh, sugar beet, uh, oil seeds, etc. Uh, so Prodimex is an example of that. Prodimex uh, is does only crops, um, sugar beets, weeds, but also increasingly uh, corn and soy. A second type of these agroholdings are integrated livestock producers. So they produce meat uh, and process meat, 
but they also grow the feed and they also own their own land and they also have their own brands and sometimes their own st stores. So the sort of degree of vertical integration is quite um, extensive and interesting. Um, this is interesting because in advanced industrialized countries, vertical integration was basically declared dead in the 1980s, right? So the, here, here they are, very vertically integrated. They, they basically do everything themselves. Uh, Mira Torg is an example of that. Um, it's the largest pork producer. Rusagro is uh, the largest sugar beet producer and that also produces pork. So I said I wasn't gonna talk more about policies, but these companies thrive really because um, Partly, part of, part of the reason why these companies thrive is because they receive very generous state support. For example, they have access to highly subsidized credit. Russia is one of these countries with high interest rates, right? So it's expensive to borrow. These companies can borrow at very low cost. Uh, they also uh, are protected by trade barriers. Uh, the most recent uh, of this is the, uh, Russia's ban on Western food import in response to the West's sanctions. So these companies have benefited from uh, public support. Uh, so what do, those, uh, what do those companies do? Uh, they produce meat and all these other things, but before they do that, uh, they bought a lot of hand. Uh, so Agro Holdings have acquired very large tracts of Russian, Russian arable land on the, some of the, Russia's most fertile arable land. So there is no official statistics, but there's sort of uh, a, a small number of industry publications and consultants who track this. And there's a ranking uh, by Agro Investor, that's an industry publication that publishes every year uh, how much land these company owns. So according to this source, there's about 45 companies that have acquired land banks uh, larger than 100,000 hectares. And the largest of those, 13 of them, have acquired land banks larger than 300,000 hectares. So our three examples are actually the largest landowners in Russia, the state. Prodimex owns 790,000 hectares, Rusagro uh, 670,000 hectares, and Miratorik 644,000 hectares. Um, so just to give you a, a point of comparison, uh, an average Soviet collective farm was about 6,000 hectares, right? So even sort of one of the smaller agri-holdings is many times larger. Uh, you know, Rusagoro would be the size of 100 collective farms, or actually 110 uh, collective farms. The total area of land that has changed hands uh, over the last uh, 15 years is estimated to be 12 million hectares of arable land. Um, this is roughly the size of all of Germany's arable land, and I did the calculation for Sweden. It's about four times the size of Sweden's arable land, uh, which has 3 million hectares of arable land. So this is this is a lot of land that changed hands from the collective farm workers who acquired this land right uh, in 92 to these large corporate uh, agro holdings. Uh, here, overall 12 million hectares, sorry about this. Uh, Andrew Barnes uh, is one of the early observers of this trend. In 2006, he called this a radical transformation of asset control in agriculture, and this was really only the beginning of the process. So why do we care about this large-scale ownership transfer? Um, some observers have called this, um, the, have called these agroholdings the Russian latifundia, sort of comparing them with Latin American landowners. This is interesting, but sort of implies a political role for these landowners that they currently uh, do not have. But historically, lots of control of land has sort of meant political power, so it's worth sort of thinking, keeping that in mind. So we, but we don't know yet what this land assets, uh, what these mean. Uh, what we do know is that they have actually related to different actors in different ways than the Soviet era farms ever did. So the first, uh, the first thing that broke down were the symbiotic relationship between the large farms and the collective and the household farms in the village, right? The new corporate farms were not inclined or interested to support and subsidize the subsistence farmers in the way that collective farms had done. Um, more importantly, or as importantly, is these new farms 
uh, farm in very capital intensive way. So they do not actually rely on labor in the same way as the collective farms did. Um, this, uh, some of this element of the breakdown of the symbiotic relationship is tracked by ethnographic accounts like um, Judith Palawas. Um, and I also, so being aware of this from these ethnography, I asked uh, uh, agro holdings, I conducted interviews with these agro holdings. So in my interviews, I sort of asked them about this, you know, what is happening in the village? Uh, in what way um, do you relate to uh, the villagers? So they often sort of told me we, we were trying to rely on them as little as possible, right? We prefer machinery, and if we do need people to sort of drive the machines or drive the tractors, we go to the agricultural universities in the regional capital and hire recent graduates and then bring them to the village to operate our expensive machines. And I'll talk more about technology in a minute. Um, the result of um, the breakdown of this relationship is that subsistence farming uh, declines quite rapidly, right? So I haven't mentioned this, but it was actually quite important in the 90s. The 90s is a period of, of economic collapse and subsistence farming plays a role in, a large role in feeding people. So this is data for poultry, right? So in 2000, when all of this starts, uh, over half of all chickens come from household farms. Uh, 14 years later, uh, it's about 20%, and it's now below 20%. Um, uh, this is the same graph for pork. Um, about 40, uh, over 40% 40 of pork comes from household farms, and now it's below 20%, right? So uh, household farming is declining quite rapidly. Um, just to give you a, a fuller picture about why subsistence farming declines, it is one, because they can no longer rely on these inputs from the large farms. Uh, it's also because uh, now cheap food is, or cheaper food isn't available in stores, right? So fewer people bother uh, raising their own animals, uh, keeping their own animals. Uh, often uh, I also uh, hear the answer that it's largely a generational question, right? It actually requires skills to farm and sort of the new post-Soviet generation doesn't have these skills and doesn't want to do it. And by the way, they also left uh, the village, right? Um, finally, finally, the state is also strongly discouraging this kind of farming. The state does not like it. It's sort of, you know, it's a source of pathogens. Uh, you know, uh, I can talk more about this, but um, several reasons why subsistence farming declines, but the pattern is quite clear. So the local connections are undone, but there's other connections that are created. Um, so I've already talked about um, the connections to financial investors, right? Uh, this is another, um, another type of connection that I've been tracing over the last few months is the connections created by uh, technological cooperation, right? So the financial, uh, the money buys land, but it actually also buys a lot of technology. Uh, and this came, also came out in interviews where my interview partners really largely wanted to buy, uh, tell me about all the fabulous fancy technology they have imported from the West. Um, so my interview partners often understood post-Soviet uh, change as technological modernization. And they sort of often uh, were, uh, wanted to talk about all the uh, technologies that they've uh, acquired. So this is a little bit harder to summarize than the financial connections, right? Because technologies are actually quite diverse, right? Um, it starts with the sort of tractor and combine harvester that you might have in mind. Um, but it really goes far beyond that. It's also complex production systems. It's sort of uh, processing facilities, packaging facilities, you know, in, in the livestock sector, you can think about slaughterhouses, rendering plants, uh, you know, places to hatch the little animals, etc. right? Um, this is complex because uh, agriculture is actually a pretty high tech sector uh, these days. So technological imports sort of show the complexity of the technology that is used um, today. So few Russian companies could supply this uh, technology. Um, the, in the West, agri-food agri has been extremely competitive for many decades, right? So Western technologies have sort of perfected technologies 
that are efficiency enhancing and, and sort of cost reducing. And they were more than happy to sell them to the Russian agri holdings who wanted to import them. So this is a partial map of where the technologies come from. Uh, Western Europe, the US, uh, South Africa, a little bit less diverse than the financial uh, uh, investors. Um, before I go on, I just want to clarify why this actually creates a uh, connection. So first, uh, these are complex technologies and imports are usually uh, accompanied by training, uh, uh, by the suppliers, and also typically by ongoing service contracts, right? So it's not a one-off transport often. And uh, a number of the most successful technology suppliers have actually sort of relocated uh, to Russia. This is true for example for Klaas, the German agricultural machinery uh, producers, and Mondi, which is an Italian packaging producer. And this was brought about uh, by uh, some of the sanctions that made it harder uh, to interact with Russia. So well, instead of pulling out of Russia, they actually just sort of went to Russia and either um, built their own facilities or bought Russian uh, companies. So, um, Technology uh, updates have increased production and productivity in many sectors. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the grain story here because the, the grain story is sort of the most uh, you know, vivid story and this is wheat, so I can tell one story about wheat, but it varies a little bit for each um, commodity. So this graph shows the historical development of Russian wheat imports uh, and exports. And this data is from the uh, FAO, here we go. Um, and uh, it basically shows that Russia went from being a, a large importer of grain, this, these are a million metric tons, to now being a large exporter of uh, wheat. And so it shows a historical reversal of the Russian grain train uh, balance. And this, this graph is um, somewhat notorious because uh, this actually affects a lot of people around the world, right? It uh, affects anybody who produces wheat and anyone who consumes wheat in the world because however much is traded here affects commo global commodity uh, prices. So a lot of people would say a presentation on agriculture is not complete without this graph. So here it is. Here's the graph. Uh, what I really want to talk about is trade, uh, you know, second, uh, third type of economic connections are new trade ties, right? Russia now exports wheat to uh, 100 countries. Um, uh, Egypt, Turkey, Nigeria, and Bangladesh are the top importers. Uh, Russian wheat is their main uh, food import, right? So they're quite dependent on Russian wheat. Uh, the map shows the 50 largest country. Uh, and so the takeaway from this map is basically, uh, you know, we create, Russia creates ties through technology imports and it creates ties with agricultural exports. So uh, I've shown you three different maps and I'm just, you know, uh, collapsing them all in one to make the point that through this agri-food sector and through this change in agri-food sector, uh, Russia has created global connections that has become very integrated in, in the global economy. So, you know, the point of this map is many colorful countries. Uh, so let me get to uh, let me get to my last uh, point about connections with um, uh, nature. Um, so this is an incredibly uh, broad uh, issue, right? How does agriculture relate to the natural environment around it, right? Uh, and it's incredibly broad and probably uh, hard to judge at this point, right? Because many of these effects are playing out over time and we're still at the very beginning of this development. So it's, you know, broad and probably too early to judge, but it's also an important question. It has actually been one of the uh, questions that uh, social science research on food system in capitalist countries have been most interested in, right? And it's also something that I'm personally interested in. So what I'm doing here is basically just give you a tiny sliver. This is something that we can already see uh, is happening. And we sort of should track forward what other things we can tell about the relationship between agriculture and the nature around it. So I will uh, talk about uh, seed stock and livestock diversity, right? So this is diversity uh, uh, of, uh, you know, has sort of generally become uh, 
a, an issue with agriculture as agriculture has, uh, the monoculture of agriculture has become more scrutinized, right? So uh, it is an interesting and you know, little known fact uh, that Soviet era livestock um, actually relied on remarkably diverse set of animal breeds, right? Uh, and diverse animal breeds that were locally adapted to different regions. This was known to Russian agronomists, of course, uh, but it became sort of more internationally known with a report by the Food and Agricultural Organization that was published in uh, 90, uh, 89, um, but the research was actually conducted by Russian uh, agronomists. Um, so this uh, report st states the following. Uh, the Soviet Union features a great variety of breeds of farm animals with 52 breeds of cattle, 30 of pigs, 90 of sheep, and 50 of horses. Although not noted for high performance, these animals showed good adaptation to local environments and feed conditions. Um, so just one thing to add here, this is about the livestock breeding in the formal and the collective sector, sector, right? The diversity of breeds in the subsistence farms was even larger, right? So let me uh, give you a few more pictures uh, of Soviet livestock to uh, get at some more of the sort of characteristics of Soviet breeds. Here are some pigs, um, and here are descriptions of these uh, livestock breeds. So for example, uh, we see the Brightovskaya, which is the most common uh, pork uh, swine breed in the Soviet Union, and it is said that it, you know, is rapidly gaining weight on low concentrate feeding, so that's an economic criteria. Uh, but it's also known for its hardiness and good ad adaptability to the climate of the northwest of Russia, right? So the breeding has actually sort of focused on two values. One are the economic values, and the other values are the, the adaptation to local climates, right? And so the same is, is the case for this other swine breed that was specifically developed for the climate of southeast Kazakhstan. So it's not like the Soviet breeders didn't care about the economic traits. They just sort of had two values that informed uh, breeding. So why uh, was this uh, important? And, you know, they valued local adaptation. You know, local adaptation was a value, but it was also really uh, a necessity because Soviet agriculture uh, was really in, in many ways different from capitalist agriculture because it was more integrated in local environment, right? It was more, another way of thinking about this is, is it's more porous, right? Animals were pastured, uh, they weren't fed these sort of maximized efficiency formulas, they just ate whatever sort of was around. Um, so they were much more integrated with local environment, hence they needed to be more locally adapted because otherwise they really couldn't make it, right? So these are just two examples of a long list of wonderful, you know, Soviet swine breeds. So all of this, um, oh, sorry, that was the picture of the similar template. Um, all of this changed um, when the agri-holdings got involved. They basically didn't want to know anything about these Soviet, they didn't want to be involved with these Soviet breeds and they uh, imported four international breeds. Um, these are the four breeds. The large white, which comes from the UK, the Landers, which comes from the Netherlands, the Durek comes from the Yen, and the Petran comes for, from Belgium. So I'm sorry this, this appears back there, but basically these are just some of the examples of the economic criteria that they are bred for, right? And so the, each of them is bred for a long list of criteria, uh, such as weight gain, size of litter, you know, how much uh, thickness of muscle, and all these kind of things. And all of these are economically relevant criteria. There's nothing here about these breeds being locally adapted because those are international breeds. They're used internationally in swine breeding facilities. So these were initially imported uh, from Russia. Um, and uh, over the years, uh, Russia has had the last maybe eight years, eight to 10 years, again, with the generous support of the state, has developed its own parent stock breeding industry. So now these pigs are sort of technically Russian pigs because they're born in Russia, but they're international breeds and are in sort of very few ways other related to Russia. So uh, why do we, and I, sorry, this is the Snominsky Genetic Selection Center that provides information about these breeds. That's a, uh, a genetic resource center that was established uh, as a joint venture between agri-holdings and the Russian uh, government. 
So, so why do we care about this, right? Um, probably enough details about pork. Um, we basically uh, see this shift happening from you know, very porous production facilities that rely on locally diverse, locally adapted and diverse animals uh, because they have to, to sort of uniform and international breeds that don't have to be uh, locally adapted because they now live in very different conditions, right? They live in conditions uh, of confinement that, you know, by design exclude any interaction with the local environment. Okay, so um, I'll conclude here, I think, more or less on time. Um, how can we think about post-Soviet change? I want to come back to this question I posed at the outset. I'm suggesting that it's interesting to think about ongoing reconfiguration of relationship between different producers, right? I've only talked about three of them. There's many more. I talked about the connections between uh, producers and uh, rural residents. There's many fewer connections now than there used to be. Uh, Livestock production is extracted from the local um, environment, uh, and instead there's many more ties to global financial and other corporate actors, as well as technology suppliers and technological experts. Thank you.